Good evening, everyone. I'm really excited that you're here tonight to um, learn a little science and, um, and uh, hopefully be inspired about some of the, the wonderful things that are happening in the biomedical research world. So I'd like to begin um, with just a breathtaking bit of data. This, is, uh, this chart here shows the sequencing costs have dramatically increased, and I think this is one of the most astonishing th things that's happened in the history of technology, especially as it relates to biomedical research. So what you see in the white line on this chart is Moore's Law. You might be familiar of that from computing. And it describes the uh, dramatic rate um, at which we have improved computing uh, processing speed over periods of time, and for most people it's an astonishingly consistent and um, an impressive uh, statistic. But what you see here as sequencing costs are listed, they've gone from roughly $100 million to sequence a single human's genome down to less than $1,000 today. Uh, and as you can see, the y-axis here is a log scale, so this is just an incredible rate of advancement in, in, in genome sequencing. And what does that genome sequencing get us? It um, uncovers the root causes of disease. And what's amazing to me is, um, this, this chart is quite out of date, but what you notice is that in a given six months month period, less than 10 years ago, we'd barely find any genes associated with any disorders. And now you see press releases coming out of the Broad, which has a major sequencing center, as well as other research institutions that are sequencing large numbers of humans in order to identify the particular mutations that are associated with particular disorders. Um, really just an astonishing rate. Here it's showing in the 60s and 70s per year, and now a give, one single research study can, can uncover 100 different alleles in, in genes that are associated with particular disorders. So it's really dramatic. And not only are we discovering uh, the underlying causes of complex diseases, but we also are uncovering new diseases. And so in, when a, a family has a child with a rare disorder, um, they can uh, now get their genome se the child's genome sequenced and uh, uncover a diagnosis. This can be transformative for families because they finally get to put a name to the disorder. They might uh, identify other families that have children with the same disorder, and so they can uh, learn about treatments that each other have tried and just have support for trying to understand the disorder. They don't often get a therapy right away um, just by sequencing the, the genome, um, but it's at least a step forward. Uh, rare diseases are actually not so rare in aggregate, and so even though a, a single disorder is classified as rare when fewer than 200,000 Americans have it, um, in aggregate, more than uh, one in 10 people suffer from a rare disease because there's quite a lot of them. Um, these disproportionately affect children, and that's because they are, are disproportionately severe. And so 35% um, die in the, within the first year of life, and many don't make it much past that without some kind of diagnosis. So we have, um, with, through genome sequencing, we've uh, uncovered the causes of a lot of complex diseases. We have a lot more new diseases that we need to, to cure. So let's turn to actually what are we going to do about all these disorders that we now have more genetic information about. Well, there have been major technology breakthroughs um, over the past decades that, that should make drug discovery better, faster, and cheaper. So for example, a synthetic chemist, the Broad has many of these working to create new chemical structures that might be good drugs. They can, uh, they've increased their rate of synthesis by 800-fold. Uh, because of automation and, and, and new techniques and combinatorial techniques. We've discussed DNA sequencing being dramatically faster. Calculating the three-dimensional um, structure of a protein is a process that's uh, improved dramatically, a thousand-fold less uh, quicker than it used to be. There's high-throughput screening, which is a, a technology that my lab uses quite a lot. Um, this, this offers a, just within this high-throughput screening field, there's been a tenfold reduction in cost, um, and just tons of other technology advancements, many of which you may have heard if you've come to other talks in this series. So on top of that, we, the total R&D spending has increased. So it's more than 75 billion, with a B, um, in 2015 for the pharma and biotech industries, not to mention the money coming from the National Institutes of Health, which supports much of the research that happens here at the Broad um, and other nonprofit academic institutions around the world. Um, so you might be thinking at this point that this is like a really awesome pep talk for science, um, and your bubble is about to be burst. Um, so I'll just warn you that um, the picture is actually not as rosy as it should be. And so I'd like to introduce you to Arum's law. So in computer sci science, we have Moore's law, which shows this dramatic improvement in computing power over time. Arum's law is the 
reverse of that in the pharma industry. And this describes the dramatic decrease in the number of drugs that we're able to discover per billion dollars of R&D spending. And so here on the y-axis, we have the uh, a number of drugs discovered per billion dollars of spending um, over time. And um, it's really sad and it's really consistent, the decline that we see. And if, if you're astute, you notice this also is a log scale. And so whereas spending a billion dollars in 1950 would get you roughly 30 drugs, spending a billion dollars today hardly gets you a third of a drug discovered. And so you've probably seen that pharma, um, that drug costs are increasing. And this is one of the underlying causes that the, we're doing more and more research, we're spending more and more money attempting to uncover the causes of, uh, the cures for various disorders. And um, this is just a, a, a depressing timeline. And so we talked about all those technologies that are, that are coming online, um, but it doesn't seem, uh, we've had, think of all the technologies that have been invented over these decades shown here. I mean, we barely knew the structure of the DNA at the, at the beginning of this chart um, to now where we've sequenced so many things, and yet with this, this um, trend has been persistent. Um, so I do, in all fairness, I think the genome sequencing that has been accomplished recently has given us a, a, real, a major leap forward in our understanding of a lot of disorders. And so I think we should see an uptick in this, uh, in this chart uh, coming soon. We just have to wait for it to kind of get through the system. However, I can't rule out the fact that there have been a lot of uh, uh, scientists like myself who have been excited about their latest technology that's really going to change this picture over the past decades, and yet it persists. So, um, I'm going to depress you for a few more slides. Um, so not only is it difficult, um, we'll, we'll talk about part, some of the reasons why it's difficult. So drug discovery is time consuming. Um, so even if you do get a drug, it, ge it generally takes about 10 years from the initial testing of compounds to it being approved for use in, in humans. A good bit of that time is spent in clinical trials and a, and a good bit of it is, used, is spent um, doing, in doing the actual research and choosing the drug that you're going to use. And you'll also notice the attrition. Um, so you start out with lots of compounds that you might test, and you narrow that down and narrow that down uh, until you get the final drug. And so uh, the, what, what's particularly re remarkable to me, this is out of date, the, um, the number of compounds that start clinical trials, only 10% of them actually and end up on the market. So 90% failure rate during clinical trials. And that's shown here across a number of different um, therapeutic areas. Some, some areas are, have better luck than others in clinical trials. Um, but overall, the average is 10% of drugs enter clinic, entering clinical trials actually make it to market. And why do they fail? Um, a fair bit of time they fail because the drugs just don't work. They don't make the disorder any better. But sometimes they also fail because they're toxic. Um, so for safety reasons, they're not progressed through the through the trials, um, and, a, and a few other reasons as well. And what you notice in these charts over time, this is just a roughly 10-year span, all the phases of clinical trials, which include some, some safety and some efficacy, all these different phases are, um, are having increasing failure rates over the past decade. So now you're thinking like, why did I come tonight? This is really terrible. Um, so what I, what I hope to describe during my talk today is some of the things that we're working on that we hope will buck this trend and that we hope will bring uh, new medicines to patients at orders of magnitude faster um, than they have been in the past. So, so let's talk about drug discovery. Um, so how do we wish we could discover drugs? I mean, the, the only way to really know that you have a drug that works is to take a chemical and give it to a human with a disorder and cure, cure it, right? Um, but we already know that we're terrible at, even, even a drug that we've spent six or eight years studying and um, have chosen out of millions of possible compounds to be specific to that disorder, we know we have a 90% failure rate. So we can't just, and we certainly can't just pick random compounds and start giving them to people. So what you really want, the only thing you really trust is does this drug work in an actual human with the actual disease? We can't do that experiment. And so we try to approximate as best we can um, by, by taking various shortcuts that, that make this more practical. So the good news is we're not limited on the compound side. On the on the compound side, pharmaceutical companies have millions of compounds, uh, literally millions of compounds that are all stored in their freezers and they test them systematically against a variety of disorders. And when they test them, um, as I said, they're not testing them in humans, they're not even testing them in mice, they're usually testing, they're often not even testing them in cells, they're often testing them in very um, 
in very uh, like sort of test tube biochemical assays. Um, but one way that we like to test compounds is in, in cell models that approximate the disorder. So instead of, um, in this particular example I'm showing here, we're looking for drugs that can cure tuberculosis. And instead of testing the drugs in humans with tuberculosis or even mice with tuberculosis, instead we're testing them with these blue mouse cells. The, the, the nuclei are labeled here in blue. And um, the, the tuberculosis bacteria is labeled in green. And our goal is, can we find any drugs that cause the tuberculosis bacteria to go away and the human cells to still look relatively normal? And um, if, if a drug passes this test, then we can go through a few more subsequent tests and then um, eventually get to, hu to human clinical trials. So that's, that's an example of, a, of a, the kind of assay that we might like to do. And how do we accomplish these assays? If we, if we really have a million compounds to test, how, how do we accomplish this? Well, at the Broad, being a nonprofit, we have um, not millions of compounds, but we have a few hundred thousand that we can uh, test. And this would not be possible without robotics. Um, in, intense amounts of automation go into these experiments. So whereas in the old days, you might test a given compound in a dish, uh, an actual dish of cells. Now we have what's called a multi-well plate. There's usually 384 of these in a, in a typical screening plate. Each one is a mini test tube with, um, with a, often a clear bottom so you can peek in through the bottom and see what the cells are doing. And that's the layout of it. Um, and we have liquid handling robots that pipette, that place dishes where you want to put them, pipette in liquids and so on, and then read out the assay. So if you're lucky, um, you may have designed an assay where the readout is, um, is like radioactive or it's a fluorescent or something where you just stick the plate in a, some kind of magical box that's a plate reader and it just reads the amount of fluorescence from every well. If you're not lucky, you end up like this poor graduate student here, uh, which is me, um, 15 years ago, stuck in a dark uh, microscopy room for the entire summer, um, trying to look uh, through the microscope at, um, at samples of cells. And so when I was working on my PhD, uh, I was trained as a cell biologist and a microscopist. And I had, uh, I'll just briefly describe my project at the time. I had an assay that I had developed. It wasn't for drug discovery, it was for my basic research. But the basic gist of it was I needed to find cells, maybe one in a thousand cells that had glowing chromosomes. And so if I found such a cell, I would zoom in on it, focus on it, take its picture. And then I would use an amazing uh, technical advancement known as a digital ruler, so I would click click on the chromosome and measure its width. So I did this like, I don't know how many times uh, over the course of a summer. And um, I'm not usually prone to motion sickness, but there was something, so uh, first of all, I had to lock myself in the room for four hours a day and just make myself do that every day to, to get the project done. And I'm not usually prone to motion sickness, but the visual scanning of like sifting through these cells by eye really made me sick, so I had to take Dramamine to, to counteract that, which made me sleepy. Um, it was actually, I mean, I didn't want to puke on the equipment, but I also wanted to stay awake and get this thing done. Um, but I have to say, I grew up on a farm, and this was the best summer job I ever had. <laughs> so. Um, it was tedious, but I got the job done, but I was only testing roughly 80 samples here. I was not testing a million compounds trying to find new drugs, and so clearly uh, advancements are needed. Um, so that brings me to my, my life here in the, in the Kendall Square area. So I started out as a postdoc at the Whitehead Institute next door and eventually came here to the Broad um, when I finished that and established my laboratory here. And we focus on automation. If, you, if you're familiar with the Broad, you know that um, one of its characteristics is taking advanced technology and applying it to important biomedical problems. So that's what we do here. I, um, I started my postdoc and I um, realized that I needed software to analyze images faster. I wasn't gonna do another project like I had done in the past. I wanted, in my postdoc, I wanted to do an, uh, work on a microscopy assay and test a few thousand samples. And so um, I thought, well, surely there's software that will do this for me. Um, and so I looked around, the commercial software wasn't cutting it, the open source software wasn't sufficing. And so I thought, well, I'm at MIT. I may as well um, see what I can, wh what I can do. Um, maybe the engineering osmosis will, will get to me. And so 
Uh, the nice thing about being at MIT is not just that there's brilliant people around to collaborate with. So I found a graduate student in computer science who was interested in working part time on this project. Um, but the really nice thing is we have such snowstorms that you end up locked in your apartment for days on end. And I really have that to thank for the birth of this software. So um, during that winter, I sat down um, as a PhD cell biologist student and just started figuring out how to code. Um, I took a one day introduction to MATLAB class, and then after that I was on my way. So I ended up writing Cell Profiler. I didn't intend for it to be a, a broadly purpose solution. I really just wanted to solve my own, uh, my own project. Um, but I found it absolutely fascinating, and it seemed very useful to a number of collaborators in, in, at the Whitehead Institute, and then ultimately worldwide, such that I ended up focusing on this and shifting the direction of my research career, and now ultimately my laboratory, to be entirely computational. So this, uh, this software is open source. It's free. Um, you can use it for a lot of people download it and use it for educational sessions for high school students. Um, but primarily, it's used by, by uh, research laboratories. And what it does is it finds cells and images and measures all of their properties. So a brief, a brief view of what this automated image analysis looks like. So typically, the software will take an image like this, where we're trying to count tuberculosis um, uh, infection. And you can separate the channels of the image. You can find, identify the different objects. Um, you can then identify the bacteria, and then just count up how, how much is, is present in the image. So that's a typical pipeline. Um, and what I really hope that you get out of today's talk is this overall message that images contain wealth, a wealth of information. So uh, this talk is not just about how do we count green blobs in images. In fact, in a given image of cells, there is just an exceptional amount of very quantitative information. It's not just like, oh, that looks nice. I can tell you know, how big are the blue parts of the cell and how much red stuff is present and how much green stuff is present. There's really a, a tremendous amount of information within each image of each cell that tells us what that cell's state is. It tells us whether it's diseased or not. Um, it tells us sometimes something of its genetic background. Um, all sorts of things are, are visible in, in these images. And I hope that you'll see by the end um, not just that computers can help us do the tedious things we would really rather not do at a scale that we absolutely couldn't do, um, screening millions of things, but also at, at, towards the end of the talk, you'll see how computers can do things that we are physically completely incapable of doing. And that's what I think is really exciting is when the computer goes beyond our capabilities and really teaches us something new. So today, we're going to go through three different waves of image analysis that have, um, that have transformed the field in the past um, 15 years or so. And we'll start out with a simple case uh, where we're using the, the software, we're using computers to replace what a human would normally be able to do themselves. So we, um, we're asking the computer, can you just measure this feature of the cells that I care about? So can you measure these green blobs um, for, as, as one example? And I probably won't get through the talk without saying the word phenotype. And I, so I want to define it here that when, um, when I, you might recall that a genotype is the DNA sequence that makes an organism or a cell um, have its properties. And a phenotype is the thing that you actually measure about how does the cell, so these are the cell features or the appearance of a cell that indicates not just its genotype, but also perhaps its environmental conditions. So our goal here is to measure particular phenotypes, to score a cell as to whether it has a particular phenotype and uh, for, for various drug discovery purposes. So first, um, the, the image analysis pipeline, um, usually you can put this together to measure whatever um, cell features you care about. And, and for example, if you're using this, our open source software, you take the original image and you um, put together a bunch of modules that do different things. And some of these modules are super straightforward, like let's split up the colors if it's a multi-channel image. Some of the steps you wish would be st straightforward, but actually are kind of annoying and difficult, like uh, correcting the illumination. It, it may not be necessary by eye to see certain things if if, if there's a, an, a pattern like this across the, the field of view of the microscope. But when you're quantifying things very precisely, this really starts to matter. And we'll see an example of that. But I would say generally, the, usually the hard part of putting together an image analysis pipeline is identifying the cells in the compartments, um, whatever it is that you're looking for. And that, that step is called segmentation, um, where you're segmenting the image into certain regions of interest that, are, um, that you want to further measure. Once you've done this uh, identification process, Measuring everything is a really straightforward task. And there's just tons of things we can measure. So not only can we count how many cells are present in this image, 
We can also measure the shapes and the sizes of the different compartments we've labeled and measured. We can uh, total up the intensities and look at the variations in intensity, uh, in other words, the smoothness of various stains that we might have added to the cells. Uh, we can look at correlations between different colors that are present in the image, um, as well as the, the relationships between how the cells are positioned. Um, do they clump together? Are they dispersed? And those kinds of things. So in the end, we can actually measure, uh, for a, a given image with uh, two or three channels, we can measure hundreds of features because we're, we're not just measuring one metric of shape. We have many metrics of shape and of size and, and so on for all these different categories of measurements. And we don't just measure cells, um, despite the name cell profiler, we also measure uh, all kinds of other things like colonies of yeast growing on an auger plate, which you, you may have uh, done experiments like, like that in uh, college or high school. Um, but we can measure different kinds of uh, cell uh, conditions where we co-culture two different cell types together um, to make a sort of fancy cell system. Uh, tissues straight from pathology from human patients can be measured by image analysis, as well as small model organisms. Uh, we can do drug discovery work in uh, very tiny model organisms that fit into those multi-well plates, for example, as well as uh, multi-dimensional images. So a movie and a 3D image are both multi-dimensional um, in that you have a sort of slice that, that um, characterize the sample that you're looking at. So lots of uh, complex model systems can be measured by imaging. And this really is um, important because it gets to what I described about how we, we wish we could test all these drugs in, human, in diseased humans, but the best we can do is find some model system that reflects the disease as best we can. And it's still practical to screen uh, thousands to millions of compounds. And so um, these, these are some of the examples of what we, what we do. So let's make this concrete with a real, real example. Um, the first uh, specific experiment I'll describe is um, how, do, how do we measure cell properties and actually cure anything, right? So um, this particular project is um, led by John Crispino at Northwestern University in Illinois. And he um, is studying leukemia, a certain type called AMKL. And uh, his idea, um, he, he had sort of a new idea for curing cancer. So, of course, if you can kill cancer cells, you should go ahead and do it. But um, if, you, if that's not working, another approach is to try to cause the cancer cells to differentiate into a state that's harmless. And that's the approach that John wanted to take. He wanted to take these um, megakaryocytic cells, uh, just the nuclei are shown here with a DNA stain, and he wanted to cause them to differentiate. And when they differentiate, they look like this. Um, they get bigger. Um, they're, they're polyploid. Poly means many. And so they have many copies of their chromosomes. And so many copies of the DNA and uh, the nuclei get much bigger. Okay, so by eye, um, you're thinking, why do you need fancy software for this assay? It shouldn't, it shouldn't be so hard to say these guys are kind of small and, and dimmer. These guys are larger and brighter. Um, but I would ask you, what would you expect a histogram of, um, of the DNA content to look like? And if it were me, I would draw something like this, that the negative control here has cells that are kind of this size. If I have size on this axis, um, you know, it's roughly that size. Um, and the, the positive control, if, if the cells are polyploid, I would expect a different pattern like that. So what I really want to impress upon you is that um, the, the image analysis is, is incredibly quantitative. And so what we actually get in this experiment is shown here. Um, so the negative control is here, and the positive control is here, where um, it's not just one one peak um, shown uh, in that image. It actually forms two pretty distinctive peaks and maybe even a little shadow of a third one here. That represents the two um, populations of cells. Half of the cells have 2N DNA content and half of them have 4N DNA content. So they've, divide, uh, they've either um, duplicated their DNA getting ready to divide or they've divided recently and it's back to 2N again, right? Um, so that's just reflecting the cell cycle, something you might not have been able to detect by eye. Um, and then what we can see in the, in the positive case, the polyploid case, is we very rarely see cells that have 2N or 4N DNA content. We instead see 8 and 16 and 32, because this is a log scale. And so um, it's pretty dramatic to me how um, specific and how quantitative the, the image analysis can be. And this is just for a, a relatively simple phenotype, how much DNA is in each, um, is, is in each nucleus. This project uh, is um, dear to my heart because it's the first one we've worked on that has progressed to clinical trials, and for, um, for a nonprofit institute to put anything into a clinical trial is, um, is really uh, rare and unusual. Um, this led to him proposing using alicertib for AMKL, and that cl clinical trial is still ongoing. <clears throat> 
Other I want to show just a few other examples of the kinds of properties that you can measure in cells. Um, mitochondrial abundance was, is important to Vamsi Mutha, who works here at, at um, Harvard Medical School and is a world expert on mitochondrial diseases. Mitochondria here are labeled in red, and he's looking for um, an increase, a fairly subtle increase in the amount of mitochondria that are present in each, um, in each cell. And in so doing, he's looking, for, um, he's looking for the genetic underpinnings, but also chemicals that can uh, change that balance for, for patients in the end. Um, and that, that's a, a project that completed a while ago. The, we've been working with Fred Ozabel and also Gary Rovkin at Mass General Hospital. They are interested in using C. elegans as a model system. So it's true they're not humans, um, but they are whole organisms and they allow us to do experiments um, in, especially in infection and in metabolic disorders where we can't otherwise um, you know, these are, uh, these are areas where it's very difficult to study them using cells in dishes. And so in this particular experiment, for example, uh, C. elegans are the good guys. Those are the model organisms that represent us. They are infected by this nasty pathogen, Enterococcus faecalis, um, just as we are. And um, uh, faecalis is a, a nasty pathogen because it tends to hang out at hospitals and it tends to be relatively resistant to drugs. And so we want to find new drugs um, that can uh, prevent infection here. And so we, we developed this assay where we take the worms, we infect them with this uh, pathogen, and then the, the worms die. And you can say, well, how do you know they're dead? And the answer is these guys are usually pretty squiggly and sinusoidal. They usually look like that. Um, and when they die, they take on kind of rigor mortis, which I think is pretty surprising. And the other thing that happens is their guts kind of explode out, as you can see here, which is really pretty terrible. Um, so when you give the worms a drug that allows them to survive this infection, uh, at least some of them are, um, are alive and, and happy and are able to survive. What's really exciting about this project, it's a little bit subtle, is that they actually, they found, um, they, we screened 37,000 compounds. Um, it was a small, relatively small scale experiment. Um, and they found 80 known antibiotics that came out in the, the assay. That means the assay works, but they actually completely ignored those antibiotics because those antibiotics are, have been discovered over and over and over again in pharma industry because pharma has been trying to directly kill uh, the bacteria for decades, and they're very good at it, and they've kind of targeted everything there is to target to kill bacteria in a, in a test tube. What he was most interested in, in drugs that don't actually kill the bacteria, but instead drugs that have this anti-infective behavior, drugs that can cure the infection, but not directly by killing the bacteria. So if you think about how those might work, um, they might... Um, they might prevent the bacterium from entering the worm. They might cause the worm's immune system to be boosted and fight off the infection for all we know. So these are, kind of, these are very novel mechanisms of action that might um, give us some, some headway towards uh, um, fighting antibiotic resistance, um, which is the, a, a worldwide problem, not, not just in the uh, underdeveloped world, but also here in the US that we're, we're starting to get bacterial strains that we have no drug that's effective against them. So these kinds of drugs would be a very different way of functioning and, and potentially very useful. So I also, I had mentioned uh, multidimensional images. So some of our assays involve uh, watching um, biological processes occur over time. So we can look at the dynamics of how cells are changing over time. And some examples are shown here. And as well, 3D analysis, where we, um, it, it's not easy to do a very high throughput experiment where you're uh, scanning through um, these biological structures, um, but it's a, it's a quite um, useful uh, type of experiment to do because you learn a lot more about the structure of the, the objects that you're looking at. And the Allen Institute for Cell Science in Seattle has a major project um, going on as, a, as part of that philanthropy to map the locations of um, proteins throughout the, the uh, human cell. Okay, so, um, so we've covered pretty simple examples where we're measuring particular phenotypes to cure particular disorders. Um, the next strat strategy I want to show you, the, the next wave, is where a biologist comes to us and says, I, I know what I'm looking for, I, I want to find cells that look this certain way, but they can't really reduce it to a single feature name. It's not like they just want to measure green blobs or uh, counting things or um, measuring distances or something like that. And in these cases, we use machine learning to score the cell for the phenotype. And so I really want to, um, I, I hope you won't turn out because, uh, tune out on, on this part because I, I would like to demystify machine learning and kind of explain it. It's actually not that complicated to catch on to what it's doing. So 
how do we use machine learning to, to allow the computer to score some complicated um, cell appearance that we're interested in? Well, the first part you already know. Um, we already prepare lots of cell samples in lots of multi-well plates. We use robot microscopes to capture all the images. Um, so we end up with millions of images and, and trillions of cells. And the software identifies the cells and measures all kinds of features about them, um, usually more than 1,000 features for each individual cell. Uh, so you already know this part. The only thing is I'm sort of depicting it schematically here as a little barcode. So in real life, you know it's actually a 1,000 features, not just 20 as shown here. Um, but, uh, but that's how we're kind of representing the uh, measurements from the, of, this, of the cell. All right, so what happens once we have all those measurements? That's where the machine learning comes in, and this is the kind of beautiful part. Uh, this is called iterative mis machine learning or supervised machine learning, where the biologist is looking at a bunch of example images of cells from her experiment, and as, each cell, as she's looking at each cell, she's deciding, does that have the phenotype I care about or not? Does it look like the certain way I care about? So, oh, okay, she's looking for cells that have these projections on them. Um, but this cell has kind of projections too, so they have to be, I guess, blobby projections, not pointy projections. So she's sorting and sorting and sorting. And as she's looking at the image of each cell and deciding whether it looks metastatic or not metastatic, or whether it looks diseased or not diseased, depending on what she's studying, um, the computer is, in, is instead just looking at the numbers, the extracted features from those images, and it's making a decision. It's starting to realize, ah, you're, you know, when, when cells have this certain property as a, as a high value, that tends to be a yes, whereas it has this as a low value, it tends to be a no, and it's learning this rule. And as it goes along, uh, the, there's an iterative step where the, the computer says, okay, I think I see what you're looking for. Here's 10 cells that I think are positives. What do you think? The biologist corrects any mistakes that are made and that um, iteratively makes the, the rule better. Once you have a rule, which is known as a classifier, it um, is very simple to apply that rule to every cell in the entire experiment and are scored as to whether, yes, they have the phenotype or no, they don't have the phenotype. Um, so they might be metastatic or not metastatic, whatever it is the biologist cares about. And then we total them up, how many of these were present in each um, sample, and hopefully identify the drugs that correspond with the samples that led to the, the cell appearing the way that we wanted to in order to cure that particular disease. All right, so this is what the actual interface looks like. That's what's happening behind the scenes. You don't actually have to know a lick of that to use the software, and it, it, um, it, this is something that um, high school students really enjoy um, playing around with because we, we have, uh, the, the interface looks like this. You have a bunch, here's all the cells from, not all the cells, here's a subsampling of cells from your experiment, and your job is to just sort them into bins. Um, in this case, the biologist is trying to sort six different cell appearances in order to uh, identify um, genetic uh, perturbations that yield particular unusual uh, cell cycle divisions, um, and just keep sorting and sorting until the, the computer learns what it is you're looking for, and then you let it do the work. So we've measured a number of different um, complex cell appearances in this way. Um, one that's uh, pretty exciting also in leukemia involved a, a very large uh, collaboration between a number of labs in the Boston area identifying drugs that reduce leukemic cell growth. And you can tell the difference between these cobblestone areas, which are uh, circled in yellow, versus uh, the remaining um, uh, hematopoietic cells that, are, um, that have their sort of round appearance. And here, we, um, in that particular experiment, we found that statins, which are normally used for lowering cholesterol, actually um, have a, a positive effect in this assay. They, they, um, they, and then when we tested them in further experiments, they extend the lifespan of mice that have uh, leukemic bone marrow cells. Um, in a second experiment, we um, were looking for compounds that can stimulate human liver cells, hepatocytes, uh, in, in growing. So if you're trying to, Sangeeta Bhatia is at MIT, um, doing some amazing work trying to make human livers. And making a human liver in a dish is a whole lot harder when you can't get any human liver cells. Um, it, it's uh, pretty challenging. Usually if there's an intact human liver, you may realize there's a wait list a mile long for patients that are in need of new livers. And so um, the amount of material that they can get to do their testing um, is vanishingly small. So they're looking for compounds that can increase the um, prolifer proliferation of these cells so that they have more material to try to make um, new livers with. And they found compounds in this assay. The goal here was to, these hepatocytes are marked in yellow and those that have kind of a smooth appearance. They're kind of rounder, they're kind of smaller, they're kind of smoother, and they're trying to distinguish them from these other cells that are fibroblasts growing all around them. And, and they did find some compounds that have that effect. 
We can use this machine learning also for worms. So in an experiment involving metabolism, you can see the obvious therapeutic in, uh, interest in identifying um, a, a, a mutation in a gene that would cause cells to be fatter or thinner. Um, and so the, these guys are labeled um, with a red dye that labels the fat storage within the, the worm. This is something very hard to study in cells in a dish um, without knowing all the pathways involved. Um, and because it's such a difficult, um, because metabolism is so tightly regulated, it's very hard to, to study all the intricate interplay of these different pathways other than in a whole organism. And so they were able to uncover genes that when you knock down those genes, um, the, the worms are either fatter or skinnier uh, than usual. And we're also using um, deep learning lately, so um, different approach than, than what I described today, but deep learning is a, a method that has been revolutionizing the computer vision world and a lot of classification tasks. And um, we have an ongoing project to try to detect different stages of malaria infection in blood smears, um, which is hard even for experts to do. It's certainly tedious, but it's also, there's a lot of disagreement between experts. Um, so we're attempting to use deep learning in that case. Okay, so um, that brings us to the end of all these projects that involve um, a biologist knowing what they want to measure. So this is where we get to what I think is um, really going to be revolutionary. And uh, the projects that I'll describe now, I included in my job talk when I was interviewing to come here to the Broad um, about 10 years ago. And um, it's, been, uh, it's been very slow going to do a lot of the underlying methods to make these projects work. Um, and in fact, it's been very hard to get this kind of work funded through the normal uh, funding streams, which are a bit risk averse. And so I'm very excited to report that it's starting to work. So I'll show you some examples. Um, where our, our goal here is to allow the computer to see beyond what humans can see. And you can kind of imagine why biologists would not be so excited or so enthusiastic that a computer can somehow do more than they who have studied cells their entire lives can see. Um, of course, we, the human visual system, don't get me wrong, is absolutely amazing. There's a, there's a tremendous amount that we can absorb very, and very quickly analyze um, by eye. Um, but there are certain things we're just not that good at. If I show you two populations of cells and I say, you know, which one is 5% bigger than the other, we just, we're just not tuned to, to measure that kind of thing with our eyes. Um, we certainly, uh, you, you're probably familiar with all kinds of optical illusions that show you where the weak spots are in the human visual system. But the thing we're really bad at is measuring um, not just one thing, like how big are the cells, we're really bad at measuring a thousand things about every cell in a very mixed population across a million compounds. So that I think no, no, one, um, no one will object to, um, to, to letting the computers at least have a try at it first. Um, so these projects, um, the goal here is to compare cell populations even if we don't know what we're looking for. Okay, so why would we want to do that? Um, I'll have to describe, describe this carefully. So it's really important to understand this concept. Um, so wake up if you are not. <laughs> this is a really important concept just to understand the, the, the rest of it. So I just have a few, few more stories to tell, but this is the under, underpinnings of them. We, we do what we, we profile cells. Um, when I say we profile them, I mean we measure everything we can about them. You already know how that's possible. Uh, we do this profiling by cell painting, microscopy, and image analysis. So what we do, if we're going to test three different perturbations, by perturbation I mean three different chemicals, or three different genetic perturbations, or three different patient cell lines, we have three different things we want to test for some reason. Um, in reality, it's usually thousands of things, but let's say we have three. We uh, stain the cells with this assay that we call cell painting. It's basically just throw in a bunch of dyes onto the cells that label a bunch of different organelles within the cell, and that's all I'll say about it. It's this assay where we stain a bunch of stuff. And then we do the image analysis, which you've heard about, and we get 1,700 features extracted from each individual cell. So you get data types that are um, uh, somewhat like this, although this is just a tiny fraction of, of what you actually get out of an experiment, because normally we have thousands of perturbations, and normally within each per perturbation we have thousands of cells. I'm only showing maybe 100 here for each um, this set of profiles. So you can see within each um, sample, we get some variation. That's normal in, in biological experiments, not just because of technical noise, but because um, biological systems do have a lot of inherent variability in them. And our goal here is to measure the similarities between these different profiles. Um, once we measure those similarities, like how, does profile one look more like profile two, or does it look more like profile three? That, that's the question we're asking across all the pairs of profiles. And if we have a lot in the experiment, then we can cluster the samples and look to see, ah, here's this grouping of samples that look the same. So from a data perspective, it's all about clustering data that looks similar. From a biological perspective, it's really completely simple. Our whole goal is show me which 
which chemical perturbations I'm studying look like each other? Which, which ones produce the same effect in cells? That's all we're trying to do. So um, you may not believe me, but being able to do this um, effectively, I think is going to, to revolutionize the drug discovery pipeline. There's no fewer than 10 different steps in the pipeline that can be, um, that could be improved by this kind of approach. And so you'll, you'll have to trust me on that for a moment, and I'll, I'll start to describe some examples so you get an idea of how, how is it that measuring similarities between compound treatments can, can, can cure diseases. So our goal here um, in profiling is to connect different um, either disease patterns that we see with different drug patterns. Um, if we test a lot of genes, can we find similarities between the genes in order to figure out uh, if, if um, genes have similar appearances when you treat, treat cells with them, that means they're usually having the same kind of biological function. If drugs have the same kind of appearance in cells, that means um, they are impacting cells in the same kind of way. Um, so those are the kinds of things we're gonna do. We're sort of gonna connect between different, the different um, uh, applications of this technology are to connect everything to everything, all right? So let's look at some examples because it probably sounds very vague and abstract at the moment. So here's, here's the drug discovery pipeline that I've showed before, but here I'm really focusing on the part um, that nonprofits and academics tend to work on, which is very early stages in the pipeline where it's not usually not too fruitful for, for pharma to um, get too involved. Um, uh, so th there's different steps along this pathway. You invent an assay that has something to do with your disease, right? You treat with a bunch of small molecules, I mean chemicals here. Um, you test a bunch of chemicals, as we've talked about. Once you have some chemical hits from your screen, like some that look promising, you kind of narrow them down to some, uh, or make variations of the structure to get really good compounds. And then eventually you test them in preclinical studies to see if they're toxic um, and effective in whatever assays you can think of, um, even if they're kind of tedious, at least you do it for a small number of compounds, and eventually get to clinical trials. Okay, so that's the, that's the pipeline. The first um, application we'll talk about is can we make better assays, using cell painting, can we make better assays um, by identifying the differences between disease and healthy? So um, it's a pretty straightforward concept that um, profiling can identify drugs for disease if we take healthy cells growing in a dish, we take um, cells that represent a disease, um, and we look to see if there's any difference between them, right? So you don't need advanced image analysis to tell you, hey, I think when you have this disease, something is wrong with your cells, right? Um, and, and think about this from the perspective of if you look at a human, sometimes you can look at a human and say, ah, I think that person has a particular disorder. Down syndrome, for example, is one that's visible at the gross morphological level. Here, um, many disorders are actually visible at the cellular level. And that was true for this um, particular project carried out by the University of Utah. I should say I had nothing to do with this experiment. I don't want to take any credit for it. Um, but they were studying this um, stroke disorder, uh, hereditary disease, uh, called cerebral cavernous malformation. Um, and they, they, know the, they know the underlying gene. This is where it gets to why, why did we bother sequencing all those genomes. They know the gene where a, a mutation, a loss of that gene causes this disorder, and that gene's called CCM2. So they knock out CCM2, and the cells look like this. And they say, hey, I think there's a difference. When you lose this gene, your cells look funky. So let's go screen a bunch of compounds and try to find a drug that reverses that change. It's a pretty, pretty straightforward concept. But what I love about this experiment um, is that, and, and how I knew they were kindred spirits, is because they, they didn't just choose drugs that they saw by eye reverse the phenotype. They actually chose two sets of drugs. One set of drugs was chosen as hits based on uh, automated image analysis, and the other set of drugs was chosen by experts who'd been studying this disease for 10 years. Like I said, it's not terribly difficult to say, hey, let's measure how much green stuff is there, and let's measure how much red stuff is at the border of cells, and that'll be the thing that's gonna give us good drugs. But instead, they also let machine learning just say, you know, try, try to reverse this disorder as much as possible. And it turns out the ones uh, chosen by automated analysis outperformed those uh, chosen by experts when they actually tested them in, in disease models of this disorder, which they have for mice, and then um, eventually they're um, getting ready to put this into clinical trials for humans. Um, so this, this was very exciting, and the result of this assay is why I joined their board and became involved, um, because I, I think this is a really great approach to, to advancing drug discovery quick, quickly. We're doing similar um, kinds of experiments in my lab, but instead of, they're using it to study hundreds of diseases all in parallel at the same time, where the exact genetic mutation is known. Uh, the one experiment going on in my lab is for a more complex disease where you don't have a single you know, killer mutation that you can just make in the cells. That, that's nice when you can do it, but you can't do that for complex diseases. 
So we're co collaborating with um, Bruce Cohen at McLean Hospital and Rakesh Karmacharya, where they've um, found a set of patients who have a very stereotyped um, versions of schizophrenia, uh, bipolar disorder, and major depression. And the idea is to take um, actual cells from patients, so take a skin punch um, from, from cells that have no mental illness, and take cells from uh, patients that have these different disorders, culture those cells in a dish, stain them with the cell painting assay so that you see all the different structures of the cells that you can, and then, um, then just look, is there any difference whatsoever when um, patients have major depression as opposed to not? And our preliminary evidence indicates that we can detect a difference in these complex disorders. And what's exciting about that is, first of all, the actual identity of the difference tells us something about how the disease is working. Um, so for example, in, in these cases, we are seeing difference in the mitochondria, which is, a, um, as you know, the powerhouse of the cell, probably, um, where that, that's responsible for converting energy. We're seeing differences in the structures of the mitochondria, um, so we, that's helpful for understanding how the disease works. But even if, we, even if the computer picked up on something that we honestly can't see by eye, it's fine, we can still screen drugs and try to reverse that, um, that fingerprint and, and attempt to, to treat the disorder. So I'm really excited to see how existing drugs that are known to be effective for these diseases behave in this assay and, and whether, they, um, whether they, re they actually can reverse this, um, this pattern seen and, and then whether we can find new, new drugs. Uh, second example, um, I have three examples of this. The second example of how drug discovery might be changed by looking, allowing computers to outsmart us is, um, is understanding diseases better, so discovering gene functions. Um, so when the road sequences uh, tens of thousands of patients and identifies, hey, we've got 100 new genes associated with autism, what on earth do you do with 100 new genes associated with autism? In the old days, when we discovered one gene per year, you would assign a person to study it, or even a whole lab would be devoted to trying to figure out what is, how is this um, gene involved in that particular disease. But when you've got hundreds coming out, every year, uh, it just doesn't scale. And we're completely, frankly, overwhelmed by the, the thousands of associations that have been discovered between particular mutations in humans and particular diseases. So how do we make sense of these genes? And um, as, it, as I said, it comes down to measuring similarities between, between genes um, based on their morphological similarity. So what we do in this experiment, we overexpressed a small set of genes, 190, and we overexpressed them in, um, in cells, and about half of them did something detectable in the cell painting assay. They changed the cell's uh, appearance in some fashion, and then for those guys that did that, we clustered them based on similarity to produce this, this clustered map. And what we found in this experiment is that um, a lot of, these were mostly known genes that we put into the experiment so that we would know if we did a good job clustering them, and sure enough, we found that um, pathways that are no, uh, genes and pathways that are known to function together and do the same kind of thing, um, gene, genes that produce proteins that bind to each other, for example, um, show up very near each other. So this is the hippo pathway, for example, is here. There's the RAF, um, RAS pathway up here. If you have a mutation, sometimes it, it maps right next to the um, to the wild type version of the gene, but not not identical to it, and, and so on. So we found uh, we rediscovered a lot of biology that was already known. And we didn't expect to find anything new in this experiment because these were all relatively well characterized genes. But what we were surprised to uncover was an anti correlation in, the, in this data. We found a group of genes that looked very opposite of another group of genes. And um, sure enough, it, we, in further experiments, um, found something new that, that these two genes really do interact in the way that was predicted by this kind of an assay. So now you can imagine if, a, if a new results come out of a of a genome-wide association study, a big, a big genome sequencing effort, you can take any unknown genes of unknown function and just try to map them onto the genes of known function. Do they map together with anything else on this chart? Um, and, and can we expand the chart to the whole genome so that we have a sense of what all these genes are doing? And the last example I'll describe is predicting drug response in personalized assays. So you may have heard a lot about personalized medicine. Um, I'll show an example here. So uh, cancer treatment is becoming high tech. I, I hope you haven't had the experience of, of, uh, of um, witnessing this firsthand. But it is now the case that when you have a, a cancer, it is possible to have your tumor sequenced. And they compare your tumor to the rest of your somatic cells, the rest of your cells, just to see uh, what is different about your tumor versus the rest of you that doesn't have cancer. And so um, 
Kind of the bad news is if you have lung cancer, for example, which is shown here, they get zillions of alleles, um, zillions of different mutations along uh, uh, dozens of different genes. Um, so it's not the case that when you have lung cancer, ah, we found the one gene that causes it, and here's the one mutation that's present. In fact, it's, it's dozens of each. Um, and so you are confronted with a case like this. You go into your doctor and says, ah, good news, you got your cancer sequencing result. You have this exact mutation in this exact gene, and you say, great, what are we gonna do about it? And um, she says, sorry, I have no clue what to do with that information. And that is the most common outcome, actually. If you're sort of lucky, so to speak, you might have a known mutation that is no where a particular drug is known to, to treat that cancer well. Um, but the vast majority of the time, the, the, the most common situation is that you have an uncommon variant, uh, a variant that we just um, have never seen before, um, or maybe we've seen a few times, we have no idea which drugs are gonna work. And so an experiment is shown here where we express genes in a dish, we make all the mutations that we saw in lung cancer, and we cluster them based on similarity. So um, this is a correlation matrix where the correlations are shown. Um, if it's red, that means that they have, these guys are very similar to each other, so these 10 samples or so look very similar to each other, whereas a separate group looks a little bit different and this group looks a little bit different. And so um, it may be that in the future you can go in and say, ah, you have this particular mutation right here, We've never seen it before, we've never done a clinical trial on it, but we do know that it's grouping together with this other gene where we do have an effective compound. And so, um, you know, not sure what to do, but it seems like you'd, you'd rather take a, compound, uh, take a drug that is effective for this one as opposed to something that was maybe effective for some other type of mutation. So if you're interested in this basic concept of how can we get more out of images than, than humans can see, um, there's a science news article on it from last year. Um, if you search for cell painting, you'll find it, as well as a more technical article um, where we describe all the, the 10 or so um, applications of this kind of technology um, that's shown there. And so with that, I want to bring it to a close. I hope you've uh, enjoyed seeing some of the, kind of from the simpler end of the spectrum where we're using computers to replace what we can do um, naturally, all the way up to um, comparing cell population in ways that humans can't do, not just because of the scale, but also because of the ability to measure so many things, um, and, and in essence, uh, um, extract so much information from, uh, from images of cells. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and especially thank um, not just the, the group that has done all this work and has worked with me over the past 10 years, but also um, all the biologists that we work with who have shared their data and, and worked together with us on projects. Thanks. All right, thank you, Anne. So as I said, we have there are two standing microphones here in the front. We have some time to take some questions if you want to come on down to those. If you are so inclined, we're also taking questions over Twitter. If you want to use the hashtag Broad Talks, feel free to go through that route and we'll try to get to them as well. Hi. Um, I was intrigued by testing for something contributing to mental illness in skin cells. I can understand testing the genome. I can understand testing yeah. the neurons. Yep. Was there a theory that there was some sort of a general problem throughout all yep. the cells in the body? And yep. is, are there only certain diseases that you would test this way? Yeah, so that's a great catch. Um, why on earth are we using skin cells to try to attack a mental disorder? And you, um, I don't know if you've been talking to the reviewers on all of our grants, but they had the same concerns. Um, and uh, all I can say, so I would not expect the approach to work all the time. So as I've, as I've described the situation here, I would not expect it to work all the time. Um, it, it is absolutely the case that for some disorders, it very well may be that you have to look at the right cell type. One could imagine that for mental disorders, you probably should look at neurons. The problem is nobody's willing to give up their neurons, um, at least not live ones. Um, and so uh, we have no choice but to study something else. And so we thought, you know what, let's just give it a try. And um, that, that was uh, one project where, um, it's the only one we've done so far, but it happened to work, um, that, that it was possible to see uh, a difference. And, and it's simply because whatever it is that's causing the disorder in neurons apparently is something that's common to all, happens to be common to all the cells. I would not expect that to be true for every disease, um, but we either got lucky or it's more common than we think in this one particular case. So that's a great question. Thanks. Can you switch over here? Uh, 
Has there been any work on using machine learning to select drug candidates for a test? Machine learning to select drug candidates, yes, definitely, in, in, at, at so many levels. Uh, actually, the computational analysis is um, being applied at all ends of the spectrum here, so in a number of ways. So one example, not something we work on, but once you know the 3D protein structure, it's possible to take um, uh, the 3D structure of individual chemicals and then computationally see, do, do they fit together in any way? So usually it's the case that if a compound binds to a protein, it often disrupts the, the function. It might activate it, it might, um, but usually it inhibits it. Usually it does something. It's usually not harmless for a, a chemical to just attach itself to a protein. So one way is completely virtual experiments where you have virtual protein, virtual chemical, looks like they fit together. Um, you can test billions of, of compounds and protein combinations that way, and then just pick a handful to actually test in real life. So that's one, one example. Um, we are, are um, using it in a profiling sense by taking the, if we look at the morphology of cells that have been perturbed for a gene that we know is associated with disease, can we find any compounds that produce that same effect? Um, and so looking up, um, using machine learning to identify um, compounds whose pattern matches has been another approach. And that's something we've just started trying, and we have some inklings that it's going to work, but nothing super solid yet. All right, if that's all, we have a light reception out in the lobby. Thank you so much for coming, and keep an eye out later in the year for our next series.